subject these last several weeks is that of grief and dealing with and endeavoring to, to manage grief. But before we, we enter into our study, I've asked Brother Dan if he would lead us in, in our prayer this morning. And I uh, would ask if any of you have a specific prayer request that you would like Dan to include. Debbie? My sister, Patsy. She's okay. Having this. Debbie's sister, Patsy Miller? Yes. Yeah, and you're going to be making another trip down there? At some point. Well, we're glad to have you back here. Well, we know you've been out of town. You've been down there caring for Patsy. We want to continue to serve to remember, remember Patsy. Uh, also, I want to I don't see Amanda here this morning. Amanda Benefield's sister, Cindy Lambert. We've been praying for her. I have anyone, has anyone had a recent update on her at all? Okay. Any other specifics? Stamps is taking medication that's making her sick, so she's fine. Good, yeah, I'm glad you included that. I guess she notified me she wouldn't be here. She just said it's really hot to her. Yeah. Who's this? Eva, Eva Stamps, oh, one Eva. of our class members. She's having to take medicine for her lungs and heart. Yeah. 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 Aaron Selby, is he improving any? Sometimes there are times that you know, well, let's, let's continue to remember and so thank you. Ron Teresa Saul is home having really crazy diabetes problems. Uh, uh, Teresa Sauls. Uh, I'll I want to add one more this morning. I had a conversation and you'll see her in the assembly a little bit later. Joyce Dicus, of course she's been having so much pain and so many problems and has had recently had surgery which we prayed we were hopeful that that would help improve but she says it's only made it worse. She's in absolute constant pain and uh, Bless her heart. I mean, just been talking to her, and she's, of course, sitting there on the, on the back row. I uh, would uh, give her a pat on the shoulder. Dan, go for our, uh, there's a lot of our members out camping right now, and I guess they're uh, coming back today, I, I think. So remember the end of there. <coughs> sure, Travis home at least. All right, well, it's so fabulous. Almighty God, we approach you with awe and we're humbled by your power, by your love, and by your grace. Lord, we thank you so much for loving us even though we fall short again and again. We ask you, Father, to, to help us to try to do better and strive to please you. Lord, we thank you so much for today, for being able to gather together with uh, others of like mind as we Praise your marvelous name. We thank you, Father, for this class. We ask you that you be with each person that's here. Father, especially in a class like this, we, we know there's pain in many of us here. And we're thankful for this class, and we're thankful for one another, and we're thankful for the love that you give us where we can lean on each other. We thank you so much for Brother Bob and for his willingness to, to share and, and open up. And we pray that you'll continue to be with him, give him continued wisdom. 
and guide him, Lord, as he strives to help us see the hope that we all have. Father, we ask you today to, to, to be with the people that are out at camping. Lord, grant them traveling mercies and, and bring them home safely. Lord, we ask that you watch over Patsy Mill and Cindy Lynn. And Eva stands. Be with Aaron Selby and Teresa Sorrows <coughs> and, and, and Joyce Dykus. Lord, each of them have difficulties that are going on, and we ask you to please provide them a measure of comfort. Be with those that are helping them. We pray that any medical efforts will be fruitful. Father, thank you especially for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Well, if we continue with this study, we want to once again go back to our foundational scripture. <coughs> Ladies and every Sunday from 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. And I, I suspect that, that many within this class are probably the point that you could probably quote it without even having to look at it and to read it. But it, it, it truly is so foundational for the study we're involved in. And there the Apostle Paul, writing to the church, to Christians, Corinth said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. <coughs> well, we have been dealing these previous classes with primarily with the subject of grief and the journey that so many of us are even involved in right now, or if we're not, we can rest assured we will be one of these days, in trying to manage and to deal with our grief. But just as the Apostle Paul says here that God is the God of all comfort, He does give us comfort. And we spent quite a bit of time this last Lord's Day talking about that comfort that, that does come from God, and I want to make a comment about that in just a moment. But uh, we want to today transition into that teaching that we had in one of the most of the places within God's Word uh, having to do with the, the responsibility, and I truly believe it is, a responsibility as well as a gift and a blessing to each one of us to, to endeavor to try to be a source of comfort uh, to others. Now I want to share with you something that I, I came upon and, and it has four bullet points to it. And first of all, it says grief never ends, but it changes. As we've said before, it's, it's, it's never going to end. It's a lifelong thing. But he goes on and says it's a passage, not a place to stay, a journey we continue to move. And that's what we're striving to do. And I'm so encouraged by, by so many of you in here as I've been able to observe uh, your, your journey through that passage. And likewise, it says grief is not a sign of weakness nor a lack of faith. And unfortunately, many times, it is viewed as just that. When an individual is going through grief, they may be accused by someone who really does not understand. They may be accused of being very weak. You know, get over it. Or, you know, if your faith were strong enough, you wouldn't be dealing with this grief. Well, that's not the case. You know what grief is? 
and, and this really hit the very last bullet point, it's the price of love. Uh, we grieve because of having had a very special loving relationship with some individual. Now, after last week's class, as we talked about the stages, we talked about the kinds of grief, we talked about the stages of grief, and basically closed out last week's lesson talking about what was added as a sixth stage, that of hope. And the wonderful passages and the encouragement and the comfort that we get when we lose a loved one who was a faithful Christian, and knowing that that Christian is now resting peacefully, we're knowing that we're going to one day be reunited with that person. And what, what a wonderful source of comfort and encouragement that is. But the point, the question that was brought up to me following class last week was, well, what about those instances when we lose someone who was not a faithful Christian? Uh, we, we can't have that same type of identical hope and comfort that one has when they lose a loved one. And, that, and that's, a, a, that's a tough one. It's a very valid, pertinent question. And undoubtedly, <coughs> there are some of us in here who have experienced that. Uh, I can tell you from my personal experience, my dad was not a, a Christian. He never did obey the God. He was a wonderful man. And where I find comfort in thinking back and <coughs> It's what a wonderful father he was. But I do not have that. Certainly God is the final judge, and we cannot make determinations on behalf of God. But we know what God's Word says. But uh, I can't have the same type of comfort as it pertains to the loss of my dad as I can with regards to the loss of my mother and other family members who were faithful Christians. So it's tough, uh, and, and I'm not going to suggest that when we lose a, a loved one who uh, was not a Christian or was unfaithful, out of duty, first and foremost, we need to remember and keep in mind that God is the final judge on that, but, but we can't deceive ourselves either. It, it, it's tough. And, and there's sort of a three-point uh, bullet point that uh, Leon Dennis shared with me several years ago, as I've told you, as I studied with him. And, and he had uh, three, three bullet points dealing with the past, the present, and with the future. With regards to the past, we learn. We learn from the past. We can reflect back upon the past. With regards to the present, we live it. We're in it right now, and it's in that journey where we're currently striving. And so in the past, we learn. In the present, we live. And in the future, we have hope. That hope that we talked about. So I, again, I appreciate your comments. And, and I don't know how helpful that was. I, I really thought about Ponders, talked to several people this past week about that subject. And, that's the only conclusion I can come to. Well, let's now kind of turn the page and start talking about the role that each of us have and, and the gift that God gives us, the blessing and the responsibility of helping and comforting others. And I want to present to you, to begin with, a statement that I believe is absolutely factual. And that is that every human being on the face of the earth will experience grief. We've said that time and time and time again in this class. But not only will every individual experience grief, but will also have opportunities to help others who are experiencing grief. So our experience with grief actually equips us to serve others. I truly wish, and uh, not for me to be the one, but I believe that we probably need lessons on this particular subject for the entire congregation. Uh, we have a lot of people that they, they don't come to this class 
not only because of the teacher, but which is irrelevant, but because they're not going through a stage of grief right now. Well, so be it. But by the same token, uh, uh, again, we all have a responsibility and an opportunity to serve and to comfort others, and that's what we want to really focus on this morning and try to zero in on that. But I want to suggest to you that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I think everyone in here is a disciple of Christ. We're all Christians, I hope and pray. As a, what does a disciple do? The disciple follows the example of the commands and the examples and tries to emulate the actions of the one that he or she is following. And as disciples of Christ then, uh, we have a challenge, we have a, uh, actually many commandments to, to do and to say those things and conduct ourselves the way our Lord himself did. Luke 18, Luke 4, verses 18 and 19, there I think is a very pertinent and relevant scripture as it pertains to this subject. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now this is our Lord Jesus actually speaking. <coughs> The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Well, He was given a mission when He came to this earth. Uh, and, and part of that mission is expounded upon and, and exposed to us right here in, in his very own words. And, and that, much of that, if you look at the depth of that, it has to do with this subject of caring for, loving, and comforting others. And if that's what our Lord, if that's what our Lord was sent here to do, and if I truly do deem and consider myself to be a follower, a disciple of His, I want to endeavor to try to do the very same thing as I know each and every one of you would as well. So I want to pose a question. I'm going to throw several questions out for you this morning. But son, help me out on this. Uh, how would you define the word empathy? You want to have any thoughts? What is empathy? Well, it's sympathy, uh, a, li a little above sympathy. It is, um, we care. We want them to know we care. Feelings. And we offer help, I guess. So it's more than me just saying, well, I sympathize with you. It is much more than that, yes. Right. So there's a part of it. Very good. Well, well studied. So it is much deeper. Uh, from, from a practical Dan, what do you Trying to put yourself in the other person's place. To try to truly feel what they feel. <clears throat> to, to, try, to try to understand what they're doing. Very good. Put yourself at their place and try to really understand. Again, much, much deeper than just sympathy for certain. Great point. Both of them. Any other thoughts? Any other additions? Yes. Would you have to have been there and done that already to have empathy? Well, would you? Would you have had to have been there and done so. that so. in order to have empathy? I can't say I don't have. Well, you know, I think uh, empathy, you, you, you gather time more and more and more in understanding. But one of the very first things that you yeah, have is this man over here had lost his wife. What would I do if I lost my wife? That'd be the thought to me, you know, and I would be starting of empathy to that aspect of it, to do that type of thing. And, and I'd, I don't think, I think you could, if you lost, maybe I lost his wife, I couldn't help but think what would happen to me. 
you know, and I think that's the beginning and empathy and, and think more and more about it to go help that other individual to, to the best that you can to, to you know, to help them to try to get through the problems. And the better part of it is if he's Christian, you know, and I can comfort with knowing that, that she's with God now and you can be with her too. That, that aspect of it. Well, that's a wonderful example. And whether you have had to have been through it or not in order to experience empathy, I don't believe you necessarily do. However, again, as we talk about God giving us comfort, if I've experienced a particular uh, disaster or issue in my life, and then I have a brother or sister or a friend who now is going through it, yes, I can even empathize perhaps even more then, but it's, it's, again, as you say, it's putting yourself, ourselves, as best we can into, into their, their situation. Bob, it's, a, it's a personal sorrow that you feel, that, that I feel, for your situation. It's more than saying, boy, that Bob, he's really going through it. It's different when it's personal, and, and it's a sorrow that you feel in your heart for what that individual's going through. It's a wonderful example. And, and kind of along the same lines as a while ago, and you, you mentioned, you know, if I can tell you if, uh, that I've been through this, so I know how you feel. Well, even if I've been through the same kind of loss that another individual is, uh, when we when we talk about the do's and the don'ts, which is going to come on, I think one of the very important don'ts is I don't say I know how you feel because I don't. Even though we may have experienced the very same type of loss, it's different for everyone. We're all different. I beg your pardon? We're all different. We are all different. And we all grieve differently. We all grieve differently. The situation, the circumstances are different. And uh, thus, I, I've had people come up to me and say, I, I know how you feel. And I lost a good friend years ago. And, uh, and I, I said, well, no, you don't know how I feel. I don't know how you feel either. It is different. And uh, the <laughs> only language I use to put in wrong is, is rather than saying, I know how you feel, I'll say, I can, uh, I can well, only imagine. The idea is there's some part of the, of the feeling is probably the same. but. The, the, the aspect that the individual had a lot of different things than the other person does. But if you just look at the thing, of to know how you feel, uh, it's trying to understand that they know some of the things, but they don't say that, and yet that statement is like, I know it all, you know, and, and nobody does, because it's different for every person, you know, but, uh, it's just difficult for a person to come up and, and say that because they don't really understand the whole thing that the other individual is having trouble. So, so true. And, yeah. and as, as we try to put our place ourselves, as we're trying to do here this morning, into the, the role and, and the position of the one who's trying to empathize with others, not being the one who's being empathized with, but the one who's doing the empathy empathizing that they you and I. It, it's real important that we keep certain of these points in mind and be aware and, and mindful of them. Let me give you a specific uh, formal definition of empathy uh, out of the dictionary. Empathy is the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from within the other person's frame of reference. Now that's just that's not saying that we know it all, but we can kind of put ourselves in their place. And i.e. the capacity to place oneself in another person's position. That's what empathy really is. And, and when I have a dear loved one who's suffering, and I have true empathy beyond the upper level of just sympathy, it, it, as I think about it so very deeply that I can only imagine the, the circumstances that that person is, is battling and, and dealing with. But I want to suggest to you that through Scripture, that empathy, just as we've discussed it, as we've tried to define it, that it's, it's not a, uh, an issue that uh, for a Christian that, well, 
I, I pick and choose. I don't necessarily have to. I'm going to suggest to you that empathy, being empathetic, is an actual commandment for a Christian. Romans 12, 15, and 16. Read this. And we've all read it before, but think of it in the context of, of empathizing for someone who's suffering. There it says, rejoice with those who rejoice. So there's a good side of that. And weep with those who weep. And be of the same mind toward one another. Getting very close to our definition of empathizing, putting ourselves in their place. So that, that's a, a, a very direct command that, that the Apostle Paul wrote in, in the book of Romans applies to you and I just as well as it did to the first century Christian doesn't it? Also in Philippians, now I, I like to refer to the book of Philippians as Paul's love letter to the church at Philippi. They had their problems, but boy, he, he filled that, that letter with so many countless issues dealing with his love and appreciation for them. But there in the fourth chapter, verse 14, you could read the preceding verses, but there he says, nevertheless, you have done well. And I couldn't make that big enough. Done well. That's what we, well done, our good and faithful service. Done well that you shared in my distress. Now, I'll tell you one person I would not want to trade places with. And that's the Apostle Paul. Now, if, if, if anyone that I know of ever had reason to be in pain and to hurt and to suffer. It was the Apostle Paul. And, and he shared that in many of his writings. But he's giving thanks to his fellow Christians that they had done well because they shared in his distress. And that's a lot of what comforting entails is, is the sharing with them and being right there with them. John, 5, John 11, 35, a prime example of one who, who really had empathy and, and love, and that was upon the death of Lazarus, it tells us Jesus, Jesus our Savior, he wept. And, and all wise and powerful and merciful Father and Jesus, he wept. So empathy, I suggest to you again, is a command. Even though he knew what he was about to do. He did, he knew it, and he didn't want to go through it. But it is. <clears throat> okay, well, question then. If we've sort of suggested, as we have, uh, that grief, that as we go through this journey of grieving, as we're all still in that journey, uh, can you give me any specific ways in which uh, going through the grief process, how that may really equip me, prepare me to better be a source of comfort to others? Well, one of the things that stuck with me was the um, point of reference that, we're, that you, know, you have up there. And when, we, when we've been on that side and we're grieving, we understand the things that helped us and comforted us, whether it's a phone call or a visit or whatever. And, and that point of reference we need to use when we go to someone who is grieving. A lot of times the point is that they were making was, uh, well, I don't know how you feel. Well, a lot of times when we're grieving, we don't know how we feel. And so as a point of reference, the things that helped us in our, in our grief, we should maintain those and, and use those when we're uh, addressing others. Well, that, that's so much on point, Jack. I mean, exactly, and as you say, if, if our having gone through the process and have having had experience with others maybe comforting us, we know what worked and what didn't, don't we? And, and so in, in that sense, I mean, because there are a lot of well-meaning efforts to comfort that have the exact opposite effect. Yeah, some, some people can do or say things with a sincere desire to be an encouragement and then does just 180 degrees. I've had that happen, and I'm sure you have as well. Yeah, it's with her, her mother, and I would, it was in the hospital, 
when she was be be very badly, and uh, I was with her, and then I said something, and she got on to me <laughs> about it. I, I don't remember what it was, but I apologized or whatever, because I had the wrong idea that you know, I, I was trying to help, but the way it was, it was a different thing to her, and she got on to me about it. Well, that aspect. So, you know, we don't do that sometimes, and we think we're doing good, but sometimes it's not, as you mentioned a while ago, because they don't, we don't know what they're getting to and what they're concerned about at that time, how sick they are, and they are. And so sometimes we just said the wrong thing. Well, let me say this about that. I'll say this about that. <clears throat> Even in that instance, I still think it's better. You have good intentions. Yeah. Yeah. And it's better to, even when we stumble, mm -hmm. if, if we have good intentions, it's better than just doing mm -hmm. nothing. And, and I appreciate what you say. Hey, any of you familiar with the, what's the phrase about walking in someone's moccasins? <laughs> Where did that originate? Probably from an Indian. <laughs> Probably from an Indian. I thought you were going to say some, from some real, real old person. I was going to say, oh, Ron? <laughs> I well, learned your joke. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm sure it was. I, I don't know where the source was. Anyway, any other thoughts on that? I mean, the point being, you know, having experience, having been down that road, having worn those same moccasins, uh, that puts us in a position to better understand and appreciate uh, what the situation was and, and what really did work in a positive way to help. Ron? Kind of back up to John 11:35, where it says Jesus wept. Uh -huh. The next verse or two said that the people watched and they said, Behold how he loved him. Compassion. Feeling, maybe not even saying anything, just being there, showing gentle compassion to people, crying with them, means a, means a lot. So if we do that, we don't have to worry about messing up with words. I'm sure. I, I, of course, again, and I, I've got some other books I'll probably mention to you if we have time here, but I, I've read a lot on this, obviously, for personal reasons as well as trying to do a decent job here. But I, I came upon something very recent, first time I'd seen this. And, and it's pretty profound and right on target with what you're saying. And, and, and it, what it says, it, it's, it's not what you say, it's not what you do, it's how you make them feel. Now that, that's pretty deep. I honestly said that. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, so, so true. Well, I, this, uh, you know, we worry about, you know, what to do, what to say, what not to say. And, and again, we're trying to prepare ourselves and better equip ourselves so we can. But even in the meantime, if, if I struggle and I don't, I don't want to say the wrong thing, I don't want to do the wrong thing, uh, but nevertheless, just being there. That alone can make a person feel feel good, can I think with every relationship that you have with someone who passes away, I mean, in my relationship with my dad would be one way. There'd be all kinds of variables. Uh, my mother would be all kinds of variables. Uh, a husband would be all kinds of variables. Mm -hmm. A divorce would be another set of variables. Whether the person who passed away as a child would be all kinds of new things or was it a hit by a drunk driver? I mean, all those things will be variables in determining how that person is feeling and the person themselves and all their variables. So I think with that in mind, I think a good question to ask someone, how are you feeling? What are you going through? What are you struggling with with this? To try to understand where they are. And then realize too that when people are in that midst of that, they often are really not part of themselves. So just kind of let things go with a grain of sand <laughs> and try to just be there and just kind of take it in to see maybe how you can help. That, that's so true and so much on the point. And, and actually, we're going to focus on that. And, and it's on your handout, I think. And when we talk about things uh, to do, 
uh, and one of the big points on that is lessons. We've got it played out and we'll talk about it. I don't know if we're going to get there today or not. But to lay your ears on them, as to say it. Just to let them talk and listen. I want to ask you another question. Do we as a body, we as simple, specifically, do we as a body, as a family of Christians, always do a good job of comforting others? No. Not always. Not always. Not perfect. Not perfect at all, are we? And I'm certain there again is my reason for feeling this is a study that the entire body of Christians here needs to go through. Uh, but uh, this is a however. I don't want to be negative on this whatsoever because Central is one is the most loving, kind, encouraging congregation that I can imagine. And I can tell you from the standpoint of how Central, how you have treated me, I couldn't ask for more. But I want to share with you a couple of examples. I, I know two different individuals who are Christian. One's a man, one's a woman. They're not members of Central. And in fact, they're not members of the same congregation, but they're faithful members of the church. And each one of them lost a spouse. The husband lost his wife. The wife lost her husband. And it's just ironic that I had separate conversations with each of them at separate times, and each one of them shared basically the same, same message with me. And they told me that with regards to the comfort that they got, they said, one of them said, you know, my Catholic friends, my Baptist friends, and I have a lot of really good, wonderful friends, and they have done a far better job in comforting and encouraging me than my brothers and sisters where I am a member. That's sad. That's a sad commentary. Now, they didn't say that they were just being absolutely mistreated, but both of them made the point, totally independent of one another, totally unrelated. They didn't even know each other. But they each made this point having to do with the fact that there are others who are not Christian brothers and sisters who have actually I've done a better job uh, in giving them comfort and, and encouragement than their brothers, brethren did. And I, 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 I'm sure we've all had instances and examples like that. Uh, I want to look real quickly at 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 11. This is down in the fourth chapter of that very same chapter, book of the Corinthians. But it says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Boy, what a statement there. With all the challenges and difficulties. But he goes on to say, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus. The, the buzzard is leaving because of the buzzard. <laughs> Being old as I am, I got to leave early today. Yeah, he, had, he, had, so he had for me to get to leave to get paid. That's okay. I'm sorry. Give it over to death for Jesus' sake. The life of Jesus also must be manifest in our mortal form. Again, a, a commandment, a wonderful commandment that we need to struggle to try to emulate ourselves in our lives, which poses a question. We want to get to some specifics, and, and we're really going to focus on this pretty much in depth this next Lord's Day, but what are some ways in which we can comfort others? Yes, Karen. I think one of the things that's hard sometimes for us is that, you know, someone has suffers, and we may say, I don't know how to help, I don't have been there, I haven't done so they do nothing. When, you know, Job, when he had his three friends come, I mean, they came and they sat in the dirt with them. And they didn't say anything. That was probably the best thing, because I don't want to start talking things kind of bad. But, you know, at least they came and they sat with them. If you don't know what to say, 
just sit there. Yeah. And, and the biggest thing you ask is, what can I do to help you? How can I help you? To, to be sincere and genuine in it, obviously, as, as we all are. I've got, in fact, there's a book by Doug Manning. It's entitled The Power of Presence. That has been, been the helping people who hurt. Uh, Doug Manning has written several books. One of you already has expressed to me that you have the book, Don't Take My Grief Away From Me, also by Doug Manning. He's written a number of books uh, on the subject of grief. Uh, I also want to tell you another book entitled Life in the Shadow of Death, uh, Amanda Benefield's son, uh, Michael Whitworth, wrote this. And it's, it's really good. And he deals with the types of grief and the stages of grief, and also what to do and what not to do, what to say, what not to say. And then also, and many of you know and are familiar with Jeff Jenkins. Jeff was the preacher at the West Side while up at North MacArthur for a while and then down at the West Side, but he lost his wife about three years ago. And he's written this book entitled Beyond the Valley of Death. Uh, I'm not peddling books, believe me, I'm not, but I get a lot of comfort. First and foremost, this is my source, as your source, it should be. Absolutely. But also, particularly when it's written by Christians, we can we can blame a lot more. So I encourage you if you're, if you're if you're having some struggles, if there's some particular areas that are giving you hardship, uh, avail yourself of these assets. But I'm going to just quickly go through these bullet points, and we're not going to get into discussion. We'll try to hit them next week. But something for you to think about: ways to comfort others, phone calls. Including text, even email, I would suggest. Visits in person, right there. Cards and handwritten notes. We're going to talk about handwriting notes, and I want to tell you, I've received a few of those from members of this class, and, and I can tell you that's just been so encouraging and uplifting to me. Uh, offer prayers of, of, and, and encouragement. We're going to talk about how to encourage and how not to. Uh, to provide meals to uh, attend funerals. We already touched on that previously. I'm going to dig into that a little bit more about how important that is. Uh, remember anniversaries of a friend's loss. I'll tell you, how, I'm coming up on anniversary number eight, eight years. And uh, those anniversaries, are, they hit you, they're, they touch you in a lot of ways, whether it has to do with the date of death, the birth date, or whatever. But we, we endeavor to try to encourage others. If we keep track of that and we know in advance, and I've already, I can tell you, I've already been contacted, though it'll be next week. I've already been, been notified by, top, by three different people in this congregation telling me that they're thinking about me. They know that it's a tough time. But that's, that's so important. But we need to think very much. <laughs> Invitations into your home. We're going to talk about the fifth wheel concept. Any in here who used to be a couple who now feels like your fifth wheel? Well, that is the truism. Invitations to go out. Uh, alert for health and financial needs. Meaningful gifts, books, etc. And then listen. This is what we suggested earlier. Laying our ears on them. We're going to talk about that at length. So, so very, very important. As they say, you know, God gave me two ears and one mouth. What does that mean? <laughs> I need to listen twice as much as I laugh. I, I have to work on that. Don't sound like that. Okay, and then send a funny card. There's a time and place for that. And to set up a meal train, which Central is so wonderful so very uh, active and involved in doing it. And then to set up a Caring Bridge or Facebook account. Anyone here familiar with Caring Bridge? Yes. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about Caring Bridge next week. And then just be there as a friend, as we said. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your comments. If you have any <laughs>
Overall, I'm going to stay questions, suggestions, please, please let me know.